It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey there, everybody. It's the Fellowship of the Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Schick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlow. Hey, gang. Les Webster. Hello, all. And Liz Newman. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing? We're back. Yes. Awesome. Happy, happy New Year to everybody. Welcome to 2019. Mm-hmm. Hope everybody out there is doing okay. So what's been going on since we last spoke, which has been a couple of weeks? It has. Um, well, I've been doing quite a bit in my downtime of, um, honestly, prep work for a couple of future episodes coming up. So I'm um, going to be cagey and not say anything about that stuff, um, although it has been chewing up quite a bit of my time. But that's in a good way, in a totally good way. Um the other thing I did was I finally got over to my comic local comic shop. Uh, what week and a half ago or so? I don't. I, I, I'm far enough away that I don't get to sh- get to show up every week. So um, I made a special trip over and picked up my junk. Um, and one of the things I kind of just grabbed off the shelf because if we've talked so much about it on the on the show or some of us have anyway, um, I was kind of curious. So I grabbed a couple of sitcomics titles. Um, I grabbed the number ones for Startup and Super Suckers. Um, And I enjoyed the hell out of both of them. Um, Super Suckers is the kind of thing that that, that's just kind of right in my wheelhouse anyway. Yeah, I kind of figured that would be. The the idea that it's done... uh, Mostly in Archie art style, I think just adds to the fun. Yeah, that just makes it. It's just hilarious. It, that, I mean, it, it adds a. Le- I think that adds a level of comedy to it right there by itself. Um, I also kind of got a kick out of the ads. There are interspersed throughout Super Suckers. There are f- fake ads added into it that are mostly in totally different art styles and for fake products and there's I thought it was pretty dang funny yeah kind of reminds me of the old mad magazine days mm-hmm. yeah me <laughs> very, too. very much in spirit yeah they're great yep <clears throat> and startup was for a for introing a, a brand new super character in essentially a completely unique super world I thought it did a really nice job it was a nice little character building exercise in 64 pages so it's actually pretty beefy and a lot of fun I'm glad yeah. you enjoyed that yeah that's that's the beauty about set comics because you're it's 399 for 60 64 pages that's that's twice the page count for a regular three ninety nine book, so you're getting a hell of a deal. Yep. And what's in yeah. what's actually on those pages is cool stuff. That's yeah. that's, that's a big help. That makes a big difference. I mean it, it, uh, sixty four pages of crap wouldn't be any fun. People wouldn't pay four bucks right. for it. But Right. Yeah. This is this is good stuff. Uh some fun fun action pack stories, uh art is done by a lot of uh, industry, well-known members of the industry, uh, you know, Ron Friends, uh, Sal Buscema, James Whitmore, just to name three right off the top of my head. There's there's a whole hell of a lot more, and, and more books coming out this summer. Uh, some of them are available digitally now. Uh, matter of fact, I've got... Uh, recently received a uh, Blue Baron 3.1 and I actually need to sit down and do a review for that 
<clears throat> but I got that uh, recently, and it's it was it was really pretty cool. It's just it's nice seeing it. But uh, the, the the physical copies won't be out until uh, June, as I believe what I was told. But there's going to be some new books as well as new issues for some of the uh, other books that have been out. So uh, you should definitely check them out. Uh, www.sitcomics.com, I believe, is the website. We'll we'll re-verify that and we'll have that in the show notes, obviously. Yeah, I'll put that in there. So cool. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Yep. I've been on vacation, and I I got a little reading done because the guys we went to um, Natural Bridge Caverns, and they did the cave thing. And I guess at my age, the only time I want to be underground again is when you're burying me. <laughs> so I stayed on top. And dang, that's morbid. <laughs> right? Well, my what anxiety. a pleasant thought. <laughs> the more you go down, you're like, wow, you know. This was formed by an earthquake. Um, what if an earthquake happens again? <laughs> or you see where the water lines used to be on the wall when it floods? So it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be down underground. Well, it wasn't raining I, at the time, was it? Jeez. Well, well, it was pretty stormy, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> but they also had this zip line, and. Um, I don't know, these little bitty girls would get on there, and they would get, like, stuck halfway across. So I was watching people run back and forth and grab the rope and pull them <laughs> yeah. instead of just leaving them dangling over the park like that. But um, when I stayed in the car, though, I read a – I'm forgetting the title. It was the Christmas DC special. It was like a post-future. Yeah, the nuclear winter. Yeah. Oh, it was pretty interesting. Some of the stories were, eh, but overall, it was it was a good read. But yeah, like I said, I've we've been on the go so much this past week, and then I get home and I still can't <laughs> sit down and unwind. So, but my New Year's resolution is to get more reading done. I have a stack I've been meaning to get to, so. Fingers crossed. It's one that makes it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the question, and this is, um, wow, I, I feel like I'm going off in a rabbit hole here. But the, the thing you have to ask yourself for that is, what are you going to give up in order to do it? That's, sleep. That's the question. <laughs> I don't need sleep. <laughs> that's, that's not good. Oh. You're going to end up in Natural Bridge Cabins way before you're supposed to then. Jeez. <laughs> right. But, you know, speaking of kind of morbid, um, we made a trip down, you know, because our farm is right outside of Waco. And most of the stuff we did was in Waco this time. But we made it to the Branch Davidian, where all of that took place. And the interesting part about it was, is one of the guys named David Thibodeau, he's a survivor from there. And he's, he's wrote a couple of books and stuff. So they're giving a tour because... I'm wanting to say it was like June of last year. They did a six-part miniseries, and um, Melissa Benoist, Supergirl, was in it. She was one of um, Koresh's wives, but really, really good. But they 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 made that off of his book. Well, once they have the production photos and stuff up from the movie, um, they wanted to get as close to the characters they were portraying. So that was kind of interesting to you know to see the real faces. But um, the tour cleared out, and he's still there. And so he sat down and talked with me, Phil, and Brandon for, golly, a couple of hours. I mean, so it was very interesting. There, I, I would have to say that's probably the my favorite thing that we did, you know, on that trip. But it probably would have just been one of those short little day trips had he not have been there. So very interesting. And they've done so much out there. But it's kind of eerie when you pass through the gates to know this is a mass grave you're going to, you know. So, but yeah, like I said, pretty interesting. And now they used to have the you couldn't take a tour through there, but now they've opened it up. And so if you're ever down that way, it is 
interesting piece of Texas history there. That does sound like fun. He was very interesting. He's had quite the life for sure, you know. And I remember, I think all of that happened in 93. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was pregnant with my oldest son at the time, you know, 51 days, of live coverage on TV, constant. So it was, I guess it was definitely weird. We've, we've seen it before, but not been on the grounds or any of that kind of thing. And then we get into there and Brandon's like, wow, um, I've seen this before, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's all over TV, History Channel, at least once a year plays some kind of Waco story. And he's like, no, this is in one of my video games. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> it's in um, Rainbow Six or something like that. Oh. It's Rainbow Six Siege. It's one of the compounds that the government comes in and raids, you know, the special teams and stuff. And I thought, wow, that's kind of, kind of, yeah. <laughs> but we were telling that guy that, and he was like, I did not know about that. That's that's kind of interesting, you know. He already knew the layout before he saw it, <laughs> you know. Dang. Yeah. In a way, it makes sense, I guess, but still. Yeah, I think I think one might play the too soon card on that one. Right. Well, twenty five years. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm trying to not yeah. think about that, but yeah. Yeah. Mm. Do you remember where you were, Mikey, when that happened? Uh, not specifically, no. <laughs> I re- I remember I remember seeing the compound being burned down. Uh, I remember the images. I just don't know. I don't have a frame for it in my own head. Well, we were we were in college at the time. Yeah. Um, I I had just finished up my morning classes because I had early morning classes, so I was already back at the dorm. And the floor that I lived on had the communal TV, and it was on while I, as, as I entered the room to get my mail and I turn and look and that was what was going on it was already in flames I was like holy crap yeah but I remember um, part of the negotiation period they started playing music and the guy we met he was like yeah they started playing like Alice Cooper nonstop as loud as they could you know he says which what they felt to forget was David Koresh, and especially this guy was known to be musicians. That's how they even met. So they're jamming and stuff. He said, well, they called the ATF up and was like, hey, we like the Alice Cooper. Can you play some Def Leppard? <laughs> and that's when you know, they cut the music because they're like, this is not working. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. That's when they changed it to like rabbits being killed and that kind of thing. We we preferred the music. <laughs> Yawning. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yawning. <laughs> Ouch. Tiny <laughs> little Michael Bowden. You know? <laughs> oh God. That would have got me to surrender. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like so it was, it was pretty interesting. And like I said, I, I've seen the story. We we watched it on TV, so it was kind of neat just getting it from someone who was there that day, you know, that was there the whole 51 days. And crazy, um, I think there was 11 of them that made it out of that. And they all went to trial, of course, you know, so her reason they came out there. But um, the, the jury found them not guilty. Well, the judge in the case threw that out and found them guilty. And they overturned it and found them guilty. Well, it went through two more courts before it finally made it to the Supreme Court. And when it it got there, it was kind of like, no, wait a minute. These people were tried in front of their jury of peers, and they found them not guilty. That should have been the ruling that stayed was not guilty. 
So they found them all now guilty. So then that opened them up where they could sue for civil. Well, the judge that overturned the first, you know, not guilty verdict was the judge over those civil cases. So, oh God, yeah, well, that's not they right. pretty much got nothing. So all of the memorials and everything else out there has all been private donations and money from their little tours that they do and stuff. So, so there was there was a lot of things that happened there that were eye openers for sure. And he's like, you know, I hate to get political, and it's like, yeah, but it's it's hard to tell that story and not, <laughs> you know. So, mm. but. Yeah, definitely, like I said, one of the best things we did. And then to lighten the mood, we went to the Dr. Pepper Museum. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that That's fun. I've been there. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't know because it, it's been a year. You know, like I said, every Christmas we go up to the farm. But um, they have a traveling museum, so half of the pieces that you see when you go won't be there the next time. But, like, when we went, there was a um, vending machine that was torn in half from a Thor commercial where, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, the special Dr. Pepper was in there that made his hammer glow. So um, he tears it in half. Well, that was part of a traveling museum. So I was excited to show Brandon, and it wasn't even there again. <laughs> oh, man. So it was like, man, she's like, no, they have so much memorabilia that they have to keep switching it out like that just to be able to show everything. So that was kind of cool, too. Plus, my best friend works for Dr. Pepper, so if we didn't go to the Dr. Pepper Museum, you know, <laughs> I'd be disowned. You'd hear about it. Yeah, I would. <laughs> but Dr. Pepper doesn't fund the museum it's actually done by a private donor also and the like free enterprise system or something like that which i thought was kind of interesting too hmm. seems like dr pepper would own their museum <laughs> you, you'd think wouldn't you yeah but down in their gift shop they still do the um the handmade dr peppers where they Ooh. mix it all and oh man those were so good <laughs> And then for Christmas, they were doing a hot Dr. Pepper. Mm-hmm. To me, that's that's too weird. I couldn't do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> we just got the handcrafted ones. <laughs> okay, let's follow that up. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> uh, I got some reading done. I picked up several books, one of what, which was the King Collection, and uh, it's an interesting read. It ties into tonight's topic, and uh, other than that, I, I kind of vegged. Like I told you folks before, I sat at home yesterday, that is, uh, New Year's Eve day and watched all six of the Tin Man movies. Uh, I'm a big fan of those that series, so I was really delighted when that came on. And I just occupied a chair. My wife said, I'm going to come back and you're going to be in that chair, aren't you? And I said, yeah, more than likely. <laughs> And I was. At least you owned it, you know. Yes. I owed up to it right away. She was okay with that. But it it was well worth the time, as far as I could see, because I do like that group of movies and wish they would show up more often. Yeah. I agree. I like movies like that. Then again, I've always kind of been a fan of the older stuff anyway. Well, these were fun movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're crime, they're mysteries, but there's, there's, there's a lot of humor to them. And just the interaction between Merloy and, and, and William Powell is just perfect. 
Yes. Sure I mean, just is. right right from the get go. So yeah, yeah. I, I kind of wish I had known that. I I did come across it, but we were we were a good chunk into the marathon, and I was like, well, maybe I'll catch it next year. We'll see. Do they do it every year? That I can't guarantee, but it would be nice. I think they did it the previous year, but I, I think they did it later in the day. Because this was this started this started pretty early in the morning. Because by the time I noticed, it was in the afternoon. I think we were into the third or fourth of the films at that point. Because it was supposed to wrap up by seven o'clock Dallas time, so we're talking Central time. So. Anyway, yeah, I caught up on some of my my uh, regular reading. Uh, also doing some work for uh, not only for 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 us the fellowship, but stuff for my for my other job the the one that does pay some, pay some bills. <laughs> hmm. um, and for New Year's, uh, actually, I was doing the Twilight Zone marathon. Uh, of course, that's something they always do. It's always kind of cool to see some of those. Uh, caught a couple of ones that I've actually I've never seen before. There was one called The Changing of the Guard that starred Donald Pleasance, and I did not know that he was actually in a Twilight Zone film or a movie show. Uh, and this actually predated a lot of uh, the American films that we, we knew him. It would be like... I think I posted it would be like another six months or so, and then you'd see him in in The Great Escape. And that was like one of his first American films because he'd done a ton of British TV and movies uh, work, but uh, had not really crossed over. Or if he had done much, it, it wasn't it, was, it wasn't a whole hell of a lot. So uh, it was kind of cool seeing that. And mainly just catching up on some, re- getting some rest. Uh, didn't get as much as I like, but uh, it seems like we never do. But uh, it, someone had made a comment a while, a while back, long talking about how how on vacations we we seem to exhaust ourselves so much that when we go back to work, we have to go back to work so we can get some rest. <laughs> And it kind of seems like it, because all of a sudden, when you're off, you're either going out of town and doing things, or you stay home to do things that you've been meaning to be doing, either around the house or or, or whatever. Right, catching up on all the crap you don't have time to do normally. Right. Yeah. So, so it was a little bit of all of the above. But it was a good time. Uh, I hope everybody... Whoever uh, does Christmas or whatever whatever holiday traditions y'all do do, hope you had a good time. I uh, hope everybody had a nice, good New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Okay, before we get into this week's topic, I want to take a couple moments to thank the fine folks at Things from Another World for being a sponsor of the fellowship. If you go to our website, which is www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net, and go to our sponsors page, you will see listings of their current sales, which right now is nothing, but there's always they always have good deals going on, whether they have a big sale or not. But uh, if you click on that link, that will take you to their website. There's usually a, a daily deal. There's usually the uh, Nick and Dent comics, like 50%, that kind of thing. So just go check it out. You click on that link on our website that lets them know that uh, we sent you their way. And uh, keep checking our website because you know, I, I, we update that pretty regularly, especially if they have some kind of new uh, uh, new specials come down. So 
thank you, Things from Another World, for sponsoring the fellowship. It's much appreciated. Okay. Let's see. This episode drops the sixth. The sixth. So we would literally be almost 85 years to the day that a brand new comic strip hit. And that comic strip was titled Flash Gordon. And it's event, Adventures of, which I did not realize this in the first place, that he was a polo player who who gets involved with this, uh, obviously, attack on Earth. And he gets uh, caught up with Dale Arden and Dr. Zarkov, and, of course, battle Ming the Merciless constantly. Uh, this was King Feature's response to Buck Rogers, which had been out sometime earlier. Yeah, it was like five years or so earlier. Yeah, something like that. 28 or 29. Right. And apparently this was done due to the fact that they actually tried to obtain, if my, if my research was correct, that they tried to obtain rights from Edgar Rice Burroughs to use one would assume it would be John Carter, which they didn't do, so they basically kind of come up with their own version. So so we figured with it, this being the 85th anniversary of Flash Gordon, we would spend some time talking about talking about the character, talking about the, the, the strip, and of course we'll have to spend some time talking about the movie. Sorry, Les. Um... <laughs> So, with that, I will open the floor and let someone start off our our discussion. I will step forward, since I'm considered the old person of this group. (laughs) Not by much, man. (laughs) Uh, Flash Gordon was around before me even in film, and it was innovative with its look into a space opera versus uh, Rogers. This one had a main villain and uh, had Flash travel to other worlds to uh, set up a defeat system for Ming the Merciless. I remember reading segments of it in reprints uh, and Alex Raymond, the creator, was phenomenal in his art. I was mesmerized by how he handled it. I had mentioned earlier I read, was reading the King Collection and the way it tied into Flash Gordon was Flash Gordon was one of the characters in this collection of new stuff. This was uh, a story that was done within the past eight years, I'm sure. But with Gordon, you, like I said, you had a, a main villain and it was wondrous as to the monsters that were portrayed in this. And I'm not just talking about huge beasts that even the some of the characters were monsters in their own right. Ming was a monster. And at this time, this was prior to the Second World War, but it had political... What, what's the word I'm trying to say? P- political... Uh, Undertones? Yes, thank you. 
there were political undertones there, and they weren't as flagrant as uh, comic strips became during the war. But you could see how people were oppressed, people were were under the rule of tyrants, and in the financial, this was after the the crash, correct? Crash was in twenty nine. Twenty nine, yeah. This started in thirty four. So this was also some way for the public to get outside their lives. They were able to reform their their lives, but this aided them by taking their minds off uh, some of the brutality that they found in those times. This was released prior to Superman, was it not? Superman was in 38. That's yeah, right. that sounds right, yeah. So this was prior to that. This was a long-running comic strip, and it was big full-color page, uh, or not full page, but sections of the paper. And it just was one of the strong points that King Features had the story was Flash being transported along with Dale and Hans to a, another world by use of uh, Sarkov's rocket ship. But they found the the planet not uh, amiable. The, the people were not uh, open to the outsiders. When they landed on planets, they were considered outsiders and thought that they were part of Ming's core. They were not happy about trying to speak about anything, especially against Ming, prior to knowing who Flash and his group were. Uh, you had, I want to say, three different worlds that come to mind. And in each case, Gordon and his compatriots had to show that they were not one of Ming's cadres and were able to set traps for Ming's uh, troops. And in so doing, they were able to uh, defeat them. Now, I was more in tune with the serials that they ran because the serials were on television broadcasts. I was able to catch parts of those. And being a kid of the 50s, space travel was always on your mind. I, I was always thinking about going to the moon and beyond because it was something different. It was something new. Uh, seeing space movies was a high point as a, a child. I got to witness things in film and Flash Gordon was probably one of the first that I got to see. I thought that 
this idea of chapters was brilliant. I hadn't seen chapter serials prior to that, but I was so happy to know that that's what they were going to do. And I, I went to uh, theaters in town when they would start running old movies and showing serials prior to them. I got to catch several of the Flash Gordon serials. The, I'm sorry? I said that's pretty cool. It was. It was really neat because I got to introduce my brother, who was many years my junior, to uh, movies like that, to serials, to cartoons. He had never seen cartoons before, and he was like six or eight years old wow. and had never, never seen cartoons. He didn't know who Bugs Bunny was. He knew who uh, Henry Kissinger. He knew who he was, but he didn't know who Popeye was. <laughs> Man. Wait, they're wow. two different people? <laughs> it's true. Dang. Wow. <laughs> but, but Flash Gordon was really a, a big point in my life as far as establishing the reality of space travel. It wasn't long after that that we did send a man into space, although it was a very small, short flight. It was something that was accomplished. And the Americans were obviously the second to put a man into space. But the space race was on then, too. If I could, and I know that there are collections of Gordon, I would love to find all the volumes of that and have them right there where I can read them at any time. Uh, like I said, with Raymond's artwork, it uh, showed new things that could be accomplished by comic strips, including a space opera. Uh, Buck Rogers was the same way, but I was not aware of Buck Rogers at that time. And I, I just laud the creation of Gordon until later. <laughs> so I'm going to step away now. Yeah. See, I find this interesting because, and, and I, I, this is going to, this is going to sound way more snarky than I mean it to, <laughs> but I mean, the idea that this started in the, in comic strips in a newspaper, um, the, the thing that we have to remember, and I, I mean, this is for a lot of people. Uh, newspapers were a much bigger, th much bigger thing back then. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, newspapers are almost dead at this point. Um, but back in the 30s, that was a, they were they were way more important. And there were a lot of them and they were all over the place in terms of whatever message they were putting out. Um, a place like King Feature Syndicate comes along and they're the ones who are basically controlling the comic strips um, oh, I want to say there was one other syndicate that did that and I can't remember the name off the top of my head but I mean there were really not very many players in that field and they would I mean they were called a syndicate because they, they did what they called syndicating um, the newspapers basically would pay King to uh, to get the the strips to run in the newspaper, um, it that kind of still goes on now, but it's not again not as big a deal because newspapers aren't that big a deal. But the thing you got to remember is back then there were a lot fewer sources of entertainment. I mean, you had movies, which was great, and they were very popular. Um, you had radio, which was 
pretty was which was way bigger then than it is now for sure. It was there were a lot more people were in into that. And you, I mean, other than that, you had newspapers, and I mean, I guess you could count live theater, and probably should because a lot more of that was probably going on at the time too. But so, I mean, this is a way to get essentially comics um, in some form or fashion in front of a ton of people, in front of way more people than you would think. Um, and it wasn't just kids reading these things. This, this stuff was, some of it was aimed at adults and. Flash Gordon was one of those that was, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it was like racy or anything. It wasn't, but they were grown up stories um, mm. in a time when that wasn't as big a distinction. Um, and it was, this was a big source of this. And I, I almost hate to use the word because it's, it's so controversial at this point. It was, it was a great source of escapist entertainment. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't mean I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, a lot of people use that term in a negative sense. Um, I disagree. I think it's I think it's a very positive thing. I think we need to get away from things that are in our lives that are bothering us from time to time. Um, and this is also, again, the late 30s. This is a time frame in which science fiction was kind of starting to be a thing. Um, it was it was it pretty much didn't exist before Jules Verne and he would have been when was he was writing stuff at the very end of the 1800s like in the 1890s Um, and then I mean H.G. Wells came along a few years later Um, these were the guys these were some of the people who were inventing science fiction at that point Um, and so this whole space opera thing didn't really exist before stuff like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon came along. Um, so in a way, all of you Star Wars fans out there, oh, this, oh, Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers, a huge debt of gratitude because you wouldn't have ever gotten there. We would have never had Star Wars otherwise. It would have been a totally different story. Mm-hmm. Yep, I agree. And and you talk about you talk about the form of entertainment. I mean, radio at that time is, is was essentially what TV or streaming services, that kind of thing, or or even just being on the internet was today. I mean, it's just you know people were actually people were sitting around the radio listening to to the shows. To, uh, whether it was comedy or, or or drama or whatever, and if I'm not mistaken, comics comic books basically came basically came into being because they were a collection of comic strips. Am I, am I not wrong about that? No, you're right. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So, um, yeah, Flash Gordon. I've I've read some of the original I've I've read some of the comic strips but I I've seen more of the, more of the uh uh Buster Crab serials and as and, and that kind of stuff uh, so that was kind of my introduction to the character and of course the 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 uh the, the movie the Sam Jones movie and, and that kind of thing it it is fun it it, it is it is escapism, and, it, and in that, yeah, it's it, it's not meant in a. It, it's just it's space fantasy. That's that's what it is, and yeah, Star Wars owes a lot to that because Star Wars is space fantasy too. A lot of a lot of the stuff is just there's there's no science there's no science logic to it, but it doesn't have to. You just you just accept it and we move on. And you just it, you're more concerned about what's going on with the story and the characters, and it was it was usually pretty action packed, uh, drama. Yeah, you talk about the political or, or social uh, themes and that kind of thing. But it it was all in all, it was a fun ride. Yeah, see, I haven't seen the the serials. I'm kind of kind of sad now that I'm realizing that I haven't seen those. I would like to. 
Yeah, I read them on, um, it's a website called Comics Kingdom. And they take all of the newspaper comics and that kind of thing and put them all in one area for you. And um, I guess I, I wasn't real familiar. I was familiar with the movie Flash Gordon. And I probably can't hear his name without singing the song to that movie. Uh, <laughs> as but, well as uh, fringes. Like, I think right now um, they they reprint. I think it's Jim Keefe that's doing the series that I'm reading, but it, it's not new. It's from June of 99. So, but yeah, that's been kind of interesting, but that's probably my first exposure to them. So you, you still can see the older stuff, but not like the older, older stuff, if that makes sense. But then I don't know how long they've been doing this one. I'm not sure how long they've been doing that either, <clears throat> but to me it's still an opportunity mm-hmm. to take this stuff in and see the the uh, creation yeah. and see how this was is handled now. Because obviously, like you say, it's much different than what was done in the past. And in so doing, you, you've got to remember that uh, their means were a lot different than from what we currently have. Thomas made that point, and I understand that. Radio at that time was the king. Radio was how people got their news. And if it wasn't by radio, they would turn to the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And newspapers were the way to do it because there was no CNN or anything of that nature. Without CNN, could the American public even get through a day if they did not have news bombarding them throughout the day is it possible to get through a day <laughs> but uh, I'd like to try <laughs> <laughs> ain't that the truth <laughs> but I uh, yeah, we can always say times were different then, and that's always true. But the innovations from Vern, from Wells, from Mark Twain. Mark Twain did science fiction. Mm-hmm. He did. You've got means of telling stories of phenomenal places, fantastic uh, island or uh, fantastic planets. And I I do personally, I consider uh, Alex Raymond's Gordon as one of the chief contributors to that thought process. And I'm very happy that I've been able to be part of the reading public of that series and hope that others will partake because it is a, to me, it's a fun, fun way to look at the uh, entertainment of the day. Is Flash Gordon still viable in this time? Is he is he someone that could that could if they brought him back more likely as a comic book now and, and did it as, a, as ongoing and and and, and do uh, you know maybe a, a TV series or a series of films that kind of thing would he still be as popular and relative, relevant as he was back 
back in the day? What do you think? I'm not sure on that one. Um, like I said, when I, I, I read it online and some of the comments, it, they haven't dated well. <laughs> you know, especially in the, the time that we live in now. But um, some of them get so upset because it's like, oh, he's going to use a dinosaur to scare people. And it's kind of like, well, <laughs> yes, comic books now, they go for the bigger shock. But if you remember the time when it was when it was done, you know, dinosaur was pretty scary. They didn't know a lot about them and they're huge and, you know. I, I think with a more modern twist, I think he could, but I don't know. Because he'd basically be like a Batman, wouldn't he? An intergalactic Batman? No special powers, just... If anything, it'd probably be more like an intergalactic uh, James Bond. Yeah. Yeah, if, 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 if you want to do something a little bit more more of a fair comparison, then, then yeah. Yeah. Well, because he's got his little gadget. Well, I guess James Bond does, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's more than a few parallels there, really. But... Yeah. And when he was in Ted, everybody loved him, so... <laughs> <laughs> And Ted too. <laughs> uh, sad to say, I watched Ted. Yep. <laughs> I had one of the new kids on the block. I had to watch Ted. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, that was that was his brother. Yeah. Well, same thing. Marky Mark. Was Marky or... Mark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Marky Mark and an animated stuffed animal. Yeah. Just when I was a kid, the thing to have was a Teddy Ruxpin. You know, you put like a Twisted Sister set off in that thing. <laughs> you know, Teddy went crazy. So, kind of nostalgia to see a walking, talking teddy bear. That's what he was supposed to be. That's what the commercial showed you he was going to be. <laughs> so, you were pretty much the target audience for that movie then. Oh, That's I was. Yep. Th- those movies, sorry. There were... There was a second one. Yeah. Which they played at Christmas, so. Did they? Mm-hmm. One and two, back to back. Hmm. I don't recall those being Christmas movies, but anyway. They weren't. <laughs> it's just they have to fill up their station with something for everybody who doesn't want to watch the Christmas porn that's on every other channel. <laughs> Christmas porn. There's a, yeah. there's a term. <laughs> PG, of course, you know. Well, right, no, yeah, not literal porn. That's <laughs> that's that's on a different channel, but I find this I... interesting. I spotted that apparently there was a Flash Gordon TV series about ten years ago. I did not know this. This is completely news to me. But in 2007, Sci-Fi. The Sci-Fi Channel had a Flash Gordon series for a season. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that either. It was updated, apparently, but I I don't know. Maybe that's why it didn't do so well, is the people who would have watched it didn't know about it. Well, there's that. (laughs) Those are the people that are still burning over the movie, so... Yeah. Actually, you know, this says that the that advertisements um, had a cover version of that song in 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 the ads for the show. Um, wow. So yeah, that, that might that have turned me away. Right. That might have chased a lot of people <laughs> off right there. It was kind of a cheesy little song. Oh yeah. I, I mean, would it be too sacrilegious to bring up the movie at this point? Because, I mean, it's probably the most recognizable thing we have. It's it's the thing that all, that most people are going to have heard of. 
Yeah. And it, uh, it was... Holy cow, was it a product of its time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and it, it had one hell of a cast, really. Yeah. And there's some amazing actors and actresses in that movie. It's just unbelievable. And, yeah, it was a terrible movie, as I recall. I haven't seen it in decades at this point. But I remember watching it as a kid and going, man, this is not right. <laughs> <laughs> This I don't know I I mean I'm like ten probably or something twelve, and I'm like I, this, this is this this is this is not good and I don't know why because I didn't know anything about movies at the time but or stories or I mean I, there's a lot of things I didn't know back then but I was like man that could have been way better I mean yeah. and like I said I was a kid. I can't. I can't imagine going back to watch it to watch it now and try to figure out what's wrong with it, just because I don't really want to spend the time doing that. But you so, don't have that much time. I just, I, I, it just, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think. I, I don't know what the people. I don't know what they were thinking at the time. I mean. I. I, I want to say at the time it was considered like a cool thing. It, it was, I don't know. Again, like I said, I think it was more a cultural thing than a than an actual story. But man, yeah, didn't well, go, didn't go over real well. From what I had read about the film, it was originally intended to be more serious, and. They lost track uh, of that. <laughs> uh, obviously, they took several left turns and 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 all that, and we got what we got. Uh, it would have been interesting to see if this, if to see if they actually had done it as a serious, uh, serious piece. What would have happened? Because, like you said, it's a great cast. There's some very strong actors that have made the names not only. Just in in in, in the, it's certainly in in this genre, in the sci-fi genre, but uh, other genres of film too, um, and and not just film, but TV and and, and theater and all that. It just for some strange reason they they decided kind of want to take a camp approach to it, and yeah, yeah, that's what a lot of people hold against it is, is is the campiness yeah it's not a great film it's it's to me it's it's bad it's so bad it's good and yeah I, there's there's is the nostalgic i have that thing too because i kind of i was sitting there in awe watching it as a kid and and then yeah i mean i look at it now and go okay why did i think this was cool back when i was a kid or that kind of thing i do that with several movies uh, that I that I loved as a kid. Well, I mean, there's something there's, I do that now with some movies. I'm watching what you know, watching something, going, okay, what was the thought, pro- the writer's thought process on this? You know, it just because that makes absolutely no sense. But you know, and, going ahead, back to Liz's question. Okay. Personally, I don't think that it would have lasted if it was brought back. Uh, For one, it would have to be so heavily uh, driven by CGI that it would have been something that would be an assault on the eyes. Then the even the CGI they would use it could be top notch, but people would thumb their noses at it and just say this is crap. I don't want to see this. I would love to see a, a new version of it. I was not that big a fan of the the Buck Rogers TV series, but it had some ideas in it. It would, 
Buck Rogers was kind of the cornerstone for Battlestar, as was obviously Star Wars. But those films were also the brainwork of the Flash Gordon creators. But personally, I don't think that a revamp of the character, because they would have to try to uh, update him to make him relevant. It's like watching, well, like I said the, the other day, I watched the Thin Man movies, and I sat there going, I'm glad they're not trying to do this, because it did not do well on television when they had that TV series. So I can't see them trying to remake the movies without being in the 30s uh, mindset. If they did it and updated it to the 2000s, no, it wouldn't have come across as well. That's what I also see with Flash Gordon. You can't update everything and get a better product. All of a sudden, the new inventions, the inventions they had in the old series, the old movies or in the comic strip, exist now. But if you try to update that, then you're, to me, you're overstepping it. I did not see the sci-fi version. Now I do want to see what they did <laughs> and see how it was handled. Are, are you sure? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I do. But you know me, I love bad things. Right. Except he's like Flash Gordon. So um, I, right, a bad movie I, has I, to be really bad before uh, Les doesn't like it. Oh. <laughs> And it was. My question to you guys is: Does it have to be updated? Could they keep? Could they keep the spirit of 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 the thirties, uh, the the vibe of the of the thirties sci-fi, but use today's technology and, and 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 still have somewhat modern stories to tell? Hmm. Um, um, you know, because well, because you're talking you talk about my update updating the characters and all that. My mind immediately popped in the I think it was a trailer that we had seen so long ago within the last two or three years of of a movie that I don't think it's ever come out. It was supposed to be like a modern. It was supposed to be like a future take of Zorro, which I didn't. I thought it was horrible. Yeah. But I remember totally loving Mask of Zorro, which which captured the action adventure of of the of the old stories, and there there was no update there. Right, it was basically a period piece. It's a period piece. Uh, so could, could that be done for the thirties? Maybe. I think for maybe a movie. But it would be harder to carry that tone for a TV for series. For a TV series, yeah. yeah. But I could definitely, I can definitely keep, you know, The Rocketeer. That was another one that was a period piece. And it, it to me, that's one of the most perfect comic book films that was that has ever been made. And it was so faithful to the book. Uh, but it, it, it's just it's just it, it's a great it, it, adventure and it, it, the thing is it, it never really caught a, got a following until years later and unfortunately you know that's 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 the sad thing about that and so you know I mean it's a possibility I mean maybe maybe and maybe we're kind of overthinking it saying it needs to be a modern thing obviously you know maybe not him be a a, a, a polo player, but you know, in in the movie, in the movie, he was a football, he was a quarterback. 
Yeah, you can still have him as a quarterback or, or some kind of athlete. That would make sense why he would be in such good shape and all that. My concern, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I would I think it would be really interesting to see this done as a period piece. My concern with it is that it's going to get compared to some things that are going to be really hard. I mean, the, the bar is going to be set really high for it because of that time frame. I mean, th- what think about it. What's the most popular period piece from the 30s that we have? That would be the Indiana Jones movies. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a really high bar. So if it's not that good, it's not going to be popular. And that's the trick with that. I mean, yes, it's a different story. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. I, I don't think it's fair, but I, I think I think you're going to have a lot of trouble selling that because if it's not if it's not that good, then they're not going to wait or even close to that good. You're not going to get a studio to foot the bill for that. That that would be your biggest concern, I think. Well, it doesn't have the name behind it. A lot of the younger kids today, they don't know who Flash Gordon is. They've never seen the comic strips. They don't even know that there used to be newspapers with funnies in them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, Brandon was like, uh, I thought Barry Allen was the Flash. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> I have failed my child as a mother. But I, I think that would be a problem that they would run into. It's not a lot of people know who Flash Gordon is. Uh, well, I mean that's a valid point, but I would, I, my counter to that was I, it would be is there would probably be more people who know Flash Gordon than John Carter. Yeah. And we did get a movie, and it was a good movie. It, it, True. The, the, the movie failed because it was not handled right, and which we, we've gone over that which, before. Which is kind of my concern here. That's kind of where I'm going with this. Is that there? You, it's fine. Don't you're, let Disney handle it. There you go. Right. You're gonna yeah. You're gonna have <laughs> issues with whoever. I mean, they're they're gonna they're gonna look at John Carter when you say that, or when when they start. When, if you pitch this to a studio, they're gonna start looking. At, well, look what happened to John Carter because that's from the same time frame. Eh, right. And it's gonna be hard to argue against that. It's gonna depend on who who. It's gonna yeah. It's gonna t- like you said. It's gonna take a name. You know, if Spielberg decides that he wants to do something like this, it's going to get made. Yeah. Who's going to Who's going to say no to him? Uh, hell, if uh, um, oh god, I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, Lord of the Rings. Peter, Peter Jackson. Jackson. Yeah. If Peter Jackson says, you know what, I I decide I want to do a Flash Gordon. Film. How many people are going to turn him away? There might be a couple. Hey, they let him do King Kong. Yeah. <laughs> Whether they should have or not is debatable. But right. Yeah, it's it's going to it's going to depend on who's there. What to say? You know, for them to say, hey, I'm interested in doing it, but you know, whatever. Yeah. And I mean, who knows? Maybe him not having a known, you know a lot of people to know about him would give them enough room where they could kind of fudge some details and you know I think a lot of times like with DC people get upset with the movies because they know the details so well they they know what was supposed to have happened and what you made happen maybe they would do better with something like this because not too many people know what happened or you know God, DC fans do that with the comics. Are you kidding? Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> so yeah, it's inevitable that they do with the movies. All right. Yeah, in a way, you're kind of arguing for the the the, the reskin, the reboot. Just... I mean, I would watch it just because of who it is. I mean, <laughs> you know, I would watch it, but they don't have that grab them like a Batman movie would. You don't really even have to know what it's about because it's got Batman in it. You're going to go watch it, you know. 
I don't know if that would hurt them here or be like, cool, let's go check this new guy out. <laughs> Who's only been on the block for, what, 85 years? Mm. <laughs> yeah, the kicker is you'd, you'd, you'd almost have to call it something else. Yeah. Just because, I mean, if you, you can't call it Flash Gordon because that got ruined. Yeah. So you have to. You can't it. call it Flash. <laughs> no, because that's already taken. It'd probably be like, "Where's Barry?" I think I think DC probably has a trademark on that at this point. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Be interesting. Hmm, that would be. Would you like to see it done then? Overall, would you guys like to see it done? Like I said, I'd watch it. Yeah. I've never been real big in sci-fi, but I'd still watch it. Yeah, I mean, in a way, this isn't really sci-fi. It's sort of. It's it's the space opera thing. Yeah. Which I'm usually down for, so bring it on. Yeah, I want to see it. I would like to see it, too, if handled properly. You know what we ought to do? We ought to do a casting call for this. Okay. <laughs> Just thought. We can do that. Do a modern. Cast our own movie. A, a, yeah. a 2019 Flash Gordon. We can do that. Could be fun. We'll do that next week instead. Oh, God. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Next, <laughs> next week's important. We got to do next week. <laughs> I had to throw my jab in. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder if you're maybe not looking forward to next week's topic. But anyway, no, I, I love next week's topic. <laughs> uh huh. I do. We'll see. Like she loves Walmart, but anyway. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Y'all know I'm like in Walmart like three or four times a week there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Don't that. I believe you. <laughs> I even like have the app. I let it take up space on my phone for the app. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we can figure we can work something out about doing a casting call. That would be cool. All right. Well, any final thoughts before we wrap things up and take a quick break? No, I would just suggest that if if you don't read a lot of the comic strips, there are a lot of good sites out there where you can kind of see this. Um, I think there's a lot of artists who contributed to this medium that sometimes get overlooked because maybe they weren't put in a book or whatever, or they weren't talked about. They weren't Charles Schultz, you know, but um, definitely there's a lot of them out there. Some of them cost nothing, but, you know, just some really good stories. And I believe, there's a couple publishers who have done collecting have have collected some of of the strips. Yes. Um, pretty sure IDW, maybe even Hermes Press has done some. So I would I would if this talk of Flash Gordon has got you interested in trying to come come up with a collection of, of some of those, I would definitely uh, check out their websites and uh, see what see what's available. It was it was flat, some of the Flash Gordon uh, strips that introduced me to Al Williamson. Love his art, and then he did uh, he did the adaptation of Empire Strikes Back that just blew me away. Mm. I mean, he he nailed the sci-fi art perfectly. Cool. And then and, cool. and then he did and then he did some of the Star Wars uh, comic strips too. So. So. Nice. It is. Okay, with that, we're going to take a quick break, and I'll start scheduling where we're going to do our 
Flash Gordon casting call, and we'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back, and it's time for our weekly picks. And for this week, I lead off. My first choice is from Archie Comics, and this is Archie Meets Batman 66, issue number six, and I believe this is the final issue. So it all comes to a head. Uh, the Cape Crusader and, and, and Archie and the gang combine forces to deal with uh, Joker and Penguin, Catwoman, Riddler, and all those who have come to Riverdale to be their criminal selves. This has been a this has been a fun book. Uh, I hate to see this come to an end, but it's been really enjoyable. Definitely campy, but it just it just it just it has it's had a nice right feel to it, and uh, I'm sad to see this go, but I think it's done well enough that. Maybe we can get a sequel. Who knows? It's been a blast. It's very tongue-in-cheek, and that's what is enjoyable about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry to see it go, too. All righty. Uh, Les, you are next. All right. For my first one, coming from Titan Books, is The Chronicles of Hawkmoon. Volume 1. This is a, a collection of uh, two stories of Michael Moorcock's worlds. And in this, you've got uh, James Cawthorn as the artist. And this is really exquisite work. It's been a long time since these are soon print. So uh, it, to me, it's going to be well worth the time to take up the, the adventures of Dorian Hawkmoon and uh, just sit back and enjoy the, the read. The characters that, that uh, Moorcock has created really do come to life in this. And, I remember one of the stories from years ago, so I've got a feeling that this will be a book that I'm going to request for myself. Yeah, Titan's been doing a bang-up job with the Moorcock stuff lately. They really have. They've been doing a nice job with that stuff. I agree. All righty. Um, let's see who is next. Liz, you are next. All right. My first one is coming out of Image Comics. It's called Gunning for Hits. Um, when I first saw this cover, it looked like David Bowie. And come to find out, this comic book is going to be written by the music producer of David Bowie. So, um, it's set in the mid 80s and New York music scene when everything was a little bit more cutthroat and hard to break in, hard to break out. So we shall see. This one will follow him and attempts to sign a rock band that will conquer the world. So um, it, it, this has kind of gotten mixed reviews because a lot of people, of course, we don't know who he is. Um, I think I myself, I'm interested because – who better knows the story than someone who's been in it and actually had to bust a few elbows to stay in it. So should be a pretty good one. So this will be the first one. Um, Also, interesting thing about this, it says that each issue will include a background feature, maybe of a different band from the 80s, but they'll also have a Spotify playlist for that band. So if you're not familiar with the 80s music, maybe this one will be the one to pick up and educate. <laughs> cool. Sounds very good. Alrighty, uh, Mikey. That brings up me. Yeah. Um, and I, my first pick is an IDW book. 
Um, and this is not going to come as any surprise to anybody. Um, I am picking Atomic Robo and the Dawn of the New Era, number one. Uh-huh. What? I know. Shocking. Um, yeah, we're getting a new Robo series, of course, because um, there's always they're always and I love that there's always a new Robo series. Um, oddly enough, the uh, the pitch for this series is actually very similar to the one for the last series, which is that um, th- this is supposedly Robo's attempt to get himself to a normal life sort of thing. Um, and of course, we know there's no way in hell that's ever going to happen, but um, it's it's always fun to watch him try um, and fail at this particular task that he tries every so often and, and tried last time. And I'm just ready for more Robo, you know. I. As in, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just gonna say, as am I. I'm ready for another Robo story. I'm always down for it. Woohoo! <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm up again, and for my second choice, this will come the surprise of no people if uh, if they are longtime listeners to the podcast. I am picking the latest epic collection from Marvel Comics. What? what? <laughs> it's like the whole world is flipped upside down. <laughs> Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> Just, re- just remember this the next time you pick an image title. <laughs> yeah, Mikey, remember mm. that. <laughs> and the focus of this epic collection is Miss Marvel, and the, the collection is entitled Woman Warrior. This collects the first 14 issues of the Miss Marvel run from 1977, and the two part uh, team up. In Marvel Team Up with Spider Man and in Defenders issue 57. So, this is the early Carol Danvers uh, developing her powers and becoming a superhero. As I was telling the guys in, in pre show, I've been waiting for this collection for a long time. I've, I've wondered why they have not reprinted the 70s material because they've done, they've been keeping the books from the last 20 plus years in in heavy rotation that I was wondering why they were kind of staying away from that I guess they were waiting for this time because uh, you know we do have a movie coming up here in a, in less than less than two months so nice little primer for those who would love to see where where this all began uh, began yep should be fun yeah just in time for the movie, huh? Mm-hmm. Just in time for the movie. Interesting historical stuff. All righty. Les, you are next. That's back to me. I'm going to go to IDW and talk about the unknown anti-war comics. According to this write-up, A few comics portrayed the horrors of war, but no blatantly anti-war stories were known to exist until now. This is true. This was a time of the Cold War and what they are going to do in this book is give you stories of war, sci-fi, fantasy, and some others that condemn the war as uh, at, at that time. And of course it was not fully known that these comics were out there at, at that present. But now since they're going to bring it forward to me, this is going to be a fun read just to see what the thought processes were. You look at all of the movies and the like that uh, give you these big red scare. This is going to give you the red scare according to the print. So I'm looking forward to this one, too. Yeah, it should be an interesting cultural document in a way. Very, 
Very nice. Very cool. Alrighty, Liv. Alright, for my last one, I am picking one from DC. Um, this was a five-part miniseries. I guess I should tell you the name. Absolute Flashpoint. Um, back in 2011, this was a five-part miniseries. Barry goes back in time. And, of course, every time that Barry goes back in time, he screws the timeline up. So this one, he comes back, and um, people who were his friends weren't. Um, <laughs> villains who used to be villains weren't. <laughs> so he, he kind of messed it up. But the main thing that's going on in this one is he has put the Amazons against the Atlidians. Is that how you say that? Atlidians? Um yeah. Kind of crazy, though, because actually my sister, <laughs> my non-nerd sister told me, you know, reminded me of this story. So it was kind of crazy that it was a pick this week. But um, like I said, I, I kind of forgot that Wonder Woman and Aquaman were so close <laughs> and that they hated each other at one point, too. So definitely good if you like the kind of Elseworlds flashpoint story to where... Nobody is who you think they are. This is definitely a good read. Um, Jeff Johns, Andy Kubert together. I think Andy Kubert, um, there's a lot of the behind the artwork, behind the scenes artwork and that kind of thing. They've put a nice little fancy cover on this for this new version. So if you haven't read this story, like I said, it's a really good story and definitely one of those that you probably wouldn't see play out before had it not been an Elseworld or a Flashpoint story. So, good story. If you missed it seven years and uh, nine years ago, check it out. <laughs> I agree. Definitely check this out. It was a good story then. I'm sure it's going to read well now. Mm-hmm. I'd say this is one of my favorites. I think the other one was when um, Martha Wayne was the Joker. I always like those kind of flashpoint or, like I said, Elseworld kind of stories. Mm-hmm. All righty. Mikey. Okie dokie. My second pick is a Dark Horse book, and this is actually the trade for a series called Modern Fantasy. Um, and this was a fun little little mini series. Um the best way I can think of to describe it is if you know anything about fantasy role playing, um, D and D, that sort of thing. Um, this is like the, like you just turn the tables, just flip it over entirely. So essentially what you've got is you've got a bunch of kind of D and D character types in the modern world, like trying to live normal lives up to a point in which, at which it all goes kind of crazy. But it's it's that kind of different look at at the whole genre that that makes it a lot of fun. Um, it, it's 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 a, it's just a cool little story, and it, I think it, it's handled in a way that makes it very entertaining. And it, I don't think you necessarily have to kind of be into that hardcore fantasy type thing to find it okay. interesting, because like I said, it's done in the modern world so it, it doesn't come across necessarily as as fantasy but it does kind of have the, the feel in the back it's it's kind of hard to describe but it's really cool it's it's a lot of fun it's it's got some really funny moments it's got some some drama some action it's just a lot of fun it's got it all it does everything very nice uh, in our uh, honorable mention, we have honorable mention this week. The honorable mention comes from IDW. It's Mickey Mouse, the 90th anniversary collection. It's hard to imagine that Mickey is 90, but in this collection, you have his best friends show up. That includes Goofy and Minnie, but also Pegleg Pete and Otomo Bleep Bleep. 
So this is going to be a collection of stories that have been going on for decades. And I'm just happy to say that they are coming out with this anniversary title and to get people to find out about the mouse. He is a legend and I would love to see him get a little more attention for this uh, event over the next few months. So let's hope that Disney does step up and say, oh, by the way, this guy has been around a while. Cool. That is cool. Yeah, it would be nice. But, yeah, it's it's nice that IDW is putting that together. <clears throat> Bravo to them. They've been releasing his little figurines and stuff in the stores for this, which is kind of cute to see how he's where he started and where he's at today. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, watching cartoons from back then is interesting anyway for, for me. I, 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 again, again, I like older stuff like that. I think it's it's interesting from a historical perspective and yep. glimpses into the culture and all of that stuff. It's fun. It is. All righty. Any special shout outs for mentions this week? Mm, I don't have anything. No. Can't help you there. Okay. Well, all right. We will move on to our regular shout outs. First off, we would like to thank the guys with Manny the Martyr for supplying the music for our podcast. Uh, definitely go check out their music. I'll have a link in the show notes. Thank you guys very much. Secondly, I'd like to thank the fine folks that make up Potter and Family on Twitter for uh, sharing sharing our little show through retweets and likes. Uh, Definitely go check them out. Uh, Appreciate the support. And the way you can look at, uh, check out what they've got, all you have to do is just put in the search engine hashtag Potter and Family as one word and just scroll to your heart's content. If you find something that kind of catches your eye, please, please, please download that episode and give it a listen. And, hey, you may be checking out, you may pick up another favorite podcast. Uh, thank you guys for your support. And finally, you, dear listener. As always, we appreciate your support. Uh, we value your feedback. If you like to contact us, if you have a comment, suggestion, complaint, uh, observation, or whatever, what have you, please, please contact us. We would, we would, we would love to hear from you. And there are several ways you can do that. You can email us at email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. Or you can go to the website and go to our About Us page, and there is a form you can fill out there. You can follow us and contact us through social media if you so desire. We are on Facebook, The Fellowship of the Geeks, and on Twitter, we are at Fellowship Geeks. And if you'd like to follow our personal Twitter account, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, Mike can be found at Mikey Geek. Liz can be found at Newman underscore L, and I can be found at Tom TC Geek. And wherever you download and listen to our podcast, whether it's through iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, uh, it would be greatly appreciated if you would rate our show. And if you have a couple extra moments, a review would be awesome as well. Uh, one, one final thought, one thing I just, I forgot to mention, but I need, I need to plug it. Uh, we are having our first meetup. It's going to be, uh, Saturday, January 12th, 7 p.m. at a Galaxy Call of Dallas comic store that is in Garland. Uh, street address is 1238 Beltline Road, Suite 365 in the ZIP 75040. It's going to be at 7 p.m. again uh, on the 12th. Please, 
if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area, would love to come hang out with us. Uh, we're going to talk about whatever is on your mind and whatever we decide to to bring up. Uh, we may have some some little goodies to to snack on and, and that kind of thing. Uh, we would love we would love to have you out there. Let's let's have a little fun. Uh, this is going to be something we'll be doing every every month. So please, by all means, come out come out and uh, hang with us for a little while. And special shout out to a Galaxy Call Dallas for letting us uh, use their store. Much appreciated. Any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Just thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you once again for listening, and we appreciate your support as always. And once again, I hope everybody has a great 2019. Until next time, read more books and support your local stores. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks and on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time, 